I felt compelled this morning with this message. I've been praying over it all week, and I believe it's a timely word. We are in a series right now. If we haven't met, by the way, my name is Adam, and I'm the pastor here. Uh, we're in a series right now called The Early Church, and we're looking at the book of Acts. You may be seated. And we're looking at the book of Acts, and we're looking at the different characteristics of this early church. Because we want to take on these attributes that the book of Acts had, this early church had. Because what did they do? They made a tremendous difference, didn't they? They changed the world. But what happened in order for them to have these attributes? What happened? It was the power of the Holy Spirit that fell in the upper room that changed everything. You see, it's not going to be us that does it, is it? Right? It's going to be who? It's going to be Jesus who empowers us, who helps us to walk out these attributes. Let's read our text together. We've been reading this every single week. This has been a series. In Acts chapter 2, verse 42, it says this, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done to the apostles. Next week, uh, we're going to be talking about wonders and signs and miracles and healings. Verse 44, now all who believed were together and had all things in common and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. They had, gener they had generous hearts. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking of bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart. Verse 47, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. So the characteristic, the attribute that we're looking at this morning is found here in verse 47, where it says, and the Lord, notice it was God. It wasn't the church that did it. It was the Lord. And the Lord, not us, added to the church daily those who are being saved. What I'm praying for, and I've been asking the Lord for, is for an anointing and a grace upon this house to see Jesus add to his number daily for those to be a part of the kingdom of God, that he would give us that type of grace, that type of anointing that this early church had, that we would begin to walk in it. You know, I was even talking, we, were, we had a meeting beforehand uh, with, with all of our production team and everything, and I man, I praise God because we, the first quarter of this year, we had seven people saved. Praise God for that. This last quarter, as we're going through the numbers, we had another seven people saved. Praise God for that. Come on. But I remember back a couple of years back, Pastor Eric had this vision of 365 people saved in the year. Our founding pastor, he had a, he had a vision of 365 people saved. And I believe that that seven people that we saw in a quarter is going to be seven people an entire week. Like we're going to see added on. We're going to see added to their number daily. Just like that early church, we're going to see people come to Jesus daily. It's only going to happen through the power of the Holy Spirit that lives within us. May we have that kind of grace that would rest on this church, that kind of anointing that would rest on us. I've entitled my message this morning, There's a Shortage. There's a shortage. Would you pray with me? Holy Spirit, would you breathe upon this word this morning? Because without you breathing upon it, it's just words being spoken. But Lord, would you take your Logos word that is so close and dear to our hearts and would you make it rhema today, God? Lord, many of us have heard this over and over again, but it hasn't really, uh, we, we haven't, even me, myself, God, we haven't really walked it out fully. God, would you give us that grace and when we begin to walk it out in our lives, Jesus. No one came here today to hear a message from me or sing some songs, God, but we all came to hear from you, Holy Spirit. So God, we say today, Holy Spirit, would you speak to our hearts today? Speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. Move in our hearts today, Jesus. We love you. We bless you. We are here for you and you alone, God. 
In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Ben. We have a, uh, a labor shortage here in America. In 2021, 47 million people quit their jobs because of the pandemic. The two industries that were affected the most were the food industry and the manufacturing industry. Maybe some of you in this room you are in one of those industries and you can see it being affected. Now, uh, my, I, I've seen this in my own life. My, my daughter, man, she loves Moe's. Like, it's her favorite restaurant. And if you know anything about her, man, she's always smiling. She always has a smile on her face. She's always happy. Like, honestly, it's not just I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm her dad, but she is the most beautiful soul. Like, she just loves the Lord. Just the most beautiful soul. And, man, I love her dearly. And she just all, I mean, just being around her brings you joy. You know what I'm saying? When you're around someone, it just brings you so much joy. And she is one of those type of people. Now, we were going to her favorite restaurant, Moe's. And Moe's her favorite restaurant, not because of the burritos or the tacos or the chips or the salsa. It's her favorite restaurant because of one thing and one thing only, and that is queso. You know what I'm talking about? Like queso, we, we say around my house that queso is the nectar of the gods. That's how dearly we think about queso. It, it is so good. And so we're going one day, and she has a big smile on her face because we're going to her favorite restaurant to get queso at Moe's, and she dips in her burrito and her taco, she dips in everything, and she's so excited. And, and we walk into the Orange Park Mall, and I see a sign from the distance. I'm like, uh-oh, this is not good. And we walk up to it, and man, there's a sign that says there's a labor shortage. And so we're closed down. And for a split moment, this girl who is continually smiling, Who's, I mean, she smiles even when she stumps her toe. Like, she's crying and she's smiling. I don't, I don't know. What's, there's something incredibly beautifully wrong with her in a way. Um, and for a split moment, a miracle happened, and she has a frown on her face. Just for, just for a second. I mean, she, she was disappointed that it was closed down. There's a labor shortage. You know, there's a, there's a coin shortage if you haven't uh, seen signs like that. Or there's a baby formula shortage. I know people who have, who have babies, they, they, man, and, and they're worried about this. They'll stock up when, when they see it right. Uh, there is all kinds of shortages within uh, our economy today because of what's happened. Really with quantitative easing, the, the printing of money, and, and everything else. But there's just been a uh, snowball effect. But you know the most concerning shortage of all? It's a shortage of laborers for the kingdom of God. Amen. It's a shortage of people that will say, God, no matter what, Lord, I will answer the call. No matter what, Lord, I'm going to go after you. Lord, no matter what, Jesus, Lord, you can use my life for your kingdom. There's a shortage of people that will say, Lord, lead me and direct me and guide me and bring me to people, God, who are far from you. Lord, my life is not my own, but it is yours. I was having a conversation with a new friend of mine on Wednesday night. Pastor Adrian and I were meeting with him, and, we, and he has this software. It's incredible. He's going to be here in a couple months. It is software incredible. He's able to track different missionaries around the world and, and, and uh, show them places they can go to be the most effective. And uh, he was sharing with me, and he said to me this, and it just really stuck out to me. He said there were missionaries around the world who were making $40 a month, $40 a month, but they're around the world and they're sharing the gospel with people on $40 a month. But I'm speaking to myself this morning, y'all, so don't feel like I'm, I'm talking just to you. It's, it's to me too. But here we are as Americans and we can't share it with our coworkers. We can't share it with our neighbors and our friends and everyone else that's around us in our sphere of influences. We can't share the gospel with them. There's an emergency, y'all. In Matthew chapter 9, Jesus was going from city to city, and he was sharing the gospel. And at one point, he came to the crowds of people. And the Bible says that his heart was moved with compassion. If you go back to the Greek word there, that word compassion was, means this. It means that his heart literally broke in anguish for the crowds of people. Like it hurt so badly because he knew. You see, you have to understand that God, Jesus, he was fully man, yet fully God. And he had limitations. We read this scripture and we think about it. Greater works will we do. 
But it's really the body of Christ that's going to do greater works than Jesus because it's us being, li- being, being, being in unity together that will do. If you go back and look at Pastor Adrian's message from last week, it is so timely. We have to be in unity. Greater works will we do as a whole. And see, Jesus, he looked at the crowds. His heart broke with compassion for them and anguish over them because he knew he couldn't reach them, all of them. He knew there was limitations. And he says this in in a teaching moment to his disciples, verse 37. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest truly is plentiful. The harvest is truly plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest. The phrase there, the workers are few. In a world that is hopeless, in a world that is really destined for hell, we have the answers. And there is a calling upon each and every person's life in this room. Will you take and answer the call to be a worker for the kingdom of God? And share it with a, work, with, with a co-worker. Share it with the neighbor. Share it with a friend. Share it with an acquaintance. Share it with that restaurant that you go to week after week, but you don't really have a conversation with the waitress that you see all the time because it's your favorite thing, you, and, and you don't have a relationship, and you need to build it and begin to share the gospel with them. Will you answer the call, and will you go where God is calling you to go to? Because souls lie in the balance. We have to have this sense of urgency in our life. There has to be an urgency in our hearts for those people who are far from God to seek and save that which was lost. And really there's two reasons why we may not have an urgency in our life. The first reason that we may not have an urgency to to go after the lost is this, is that we don't have a daily encounter with God. You don't have a personal encounter daily encounter with God. And you might be saying, Adam, I don't know what a daily encounter with God is. I don't know what that really looks like. It's it's spending time in worship daily. It's spending time in prayer daily. And it's reading the word of God daily. Why don't you have an urgency? Because maybe you're not spending time with the Lord daily. If you need help with that, we have personal encounter guys that are on the table out there. The second reason you don't have an urgency is that you may not really be saved. You may not really have given your really full, your entire life to Jesus. The Bible says narrow is the road that leads to life and wide is the road that leads to death. We can think that we're following him. We can be going through the motions, but we've never really followed him. You know, there's a A quote by Charles Spurgeon, it's hard to read, it's hard to really look at, and he says this, every Christian is either a missionary or an imposter. Every Christian is either a missionary or is an imposter. Because how can we be saved? How can we spend time in his presence daily? and not have a heart to share the gospel with this world. How can we do that? I think it's almost impossible if we're really really saved, if we really spend time with him daily, how can we not share about the one that we love because, man, our heart would break for what breaks his. Because there are literally, I was thinking this past week, there's literally, I'm so thankful that when I get to heaven, I'm going to spend time with my mom, spend time with the people that have passed before me. There are people who are not going to be able to say the the same thing. There are people that you love, who you care about, that right now, if they were to die, you wouldn't see them for eternity. If we really believe what's going to happen in eternity, man, we would have to be so selfish not to share the love of Jesus with people. There's a value that we have around here of evangelism, one of our values. And we put it like this. We say we want to take God encounters and we give them away. It says this, we value the urgent responsibility and privilege 
You know, the Lord spoke to me this past week. He corrected me on Monday when I was in some prayer time. And he said to me, Adam, stop looking at like serving me like it's a sacrifice. Start looking at it like it's a privilege. Y'all, it is a privilege to be a worker for the kingdom of God. It is a privilege to obey him. We're talking about having a relationship with the king of the universe. We're talking about having a relationship with the person who put the stars in the sky, who formed the universe, who knows everything, who sees everything, who knows it all. It is a privilege to obey that type of God who knows everything. And he wants relationship with me and you. It is a privilege to serve the Lord. It is not a sacrifice. We get on our tangents sometimes. We say, man, it's, a, it's such a sacrifice. Oh, man, I've got to go, and I've got to, I've got to serve, and I've got to do this. And uh, I've got to show, really, Adam, I've got to show the gospel of people. Listen, it is a privilege to be obedient to the Lord. It is a privilege. So we value the urgent responsibility and privilege. Say privilege. Privilege given to us by God to proclaim the gospel to all people, tribes, and nations. Listen, it's not just for us in our sphere of influence, but it's actually for the nations. We, we want to take the encounters that we're having here. I believe that God's positioning us to experience revival. We want to take it to, to our sphere of influence. We want to take it to this region. We want to take it to Guyana. We want to take it to Africa. We want to take it around the world, and we want to give it away. How selfish would it be for us just to want an outpouring of his presence and revival without giving it away to people? We have to give it away. We evangelize by sharing the knowledge and understanding of God that we receive in our daily encounters for him. For the believer, evangelism starts with a daily encounter. Now verse 38 here, where it says, send out laborers into his harvest. Send out is a Greek word, ekbalo. Ekbalo means this. Ekbalo means to thrust out, to force them out. So let's read this. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to force out. Therefore, pray for the Lord of harvest to thrust out laborers into his harvest. You see the urgency in this word? Pray that the Lord of the harvest pushes them out, sends them out. You see the urgency? An urgency to live on mission. An urgency to seek and save the lost. An urgency to seek his presence and build his people. An urgency to go to your, your school, to go to your, your workplace, to go everywhere sharing the gospel. There is an urgency. There is an emergency, y'all, that we need to go and we need to feel that urgency to share the gospel with the lost in our hurting world. You see, our, this life, what we're about, it's not about us. It's so much bigger than that. It's not about your dreams. It's not about your wants. It's not about your desires. But it's a privilege because we get to serve God. Our life is his and his alone when we've come into the kingdom of God. We have to understand it. We have to walk in it. Lord, help us. Because my friend, you're called to be a warrior, to be set apart, to live a life worthy of the calling, to be a great defender of the faith. And there's no better example of someone living this out besides Jesus than if you study the life of Paul. In Acts chapter 18, which is going to be our text today, in Acts chapter 18, uh, you got to know what type of city Paul is reaching here before we read it. Paul is reaching the city of Corinth. And Corinth is a city that values philosophy, rhetoric, and debate. Okay? They value those things over the truth. Sounds a lot like America today, doesn't it? They value debate and how you say things and, and how your words are. Sounds a lot like us today in America. So you've got to know that as we read this text. Let's read it together. This is the type of city that Paul is reaching. In Corinth. Verse 1 After these things, Paul departed from Athens and went to Corinth. And he found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla. And he came to them. Verse 3 So, because he was in the same trade, he stayed with them and worked. For by occupation, they were tent makers. So, Paul's a tent maker. And he reasoned in the synagogues every Sabbath and persuaded both Jews and Greeks. So we see that the way he persuaded them later on, I'm about to read, I'll show you, that it's through, he persuaded them through 
the Holy Spirit. The power of the Holy Spirit working in him. Verse 5. When Silas and Timothy had come from Macedonia, Paul was compelled by the Spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus is the Christ. But when they opposed him and blasphemed, he shook his garments and said to them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. So Paul is rejected here. Verse 7. And he departed from there and entered the house of a certain man named Justice one who worshiped God, whose house was next door to the synagogue. Then Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his household, and many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed, were baptized. You never know what impact that that person that you share the gospel with will have. Imagine the person who led Billy Graham to Jesus. Like, man, that is some good fruit. But when you get to heaven... And you realize, man, I led Billy Graham to Jesus, and now he saved all, like, incredible. So Paul wins over a leader. Verse 9, now the Lord spoke to Paul in the night by a vision. So he encourages him. He says this, do not be afraid, but speak, and do not keep silent, for I am with you. And no one will attack you to hurt you, for I have many people in in this city. And he continued there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. So the Lord encourages him through this vision, and he's able to stay there for another year and six months in Corinth. Now, Paul, he follows up his time in Corinth with a letter. We know it as 1 Corinthians. So he's in uh, Corinth from A.D. 50, scholars believe, to A.D. 52, sometime in that, in, in that time frame. He writes 1 Corinthians to the city of Corinth, uh, which is here we find in Acts chapter 18. He writes 1 Corinthians in A.D. 53 to 55 or so, uh, scholars believe. So he writes this follow-up letter to them uh, two, to, two to four years later after his time there. Okay, so I want to read now 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. I want to give you a couple of things that we can learn from this text. Remember, this is a city that values philosophy, rhetoric, and debate. He says this, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1. And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined, say determined. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, that your faith should be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. So this morning, I want to give you three things that we can learn of how Paul reached the city of Corinth and his approach to reaching this city. Remember, there's a shortage of laborers, church. Number one, there's a shortage of believers determined to keep it simple. There's a shortage of believers determined to keep it simple. You see, Paul could have gone to Corinth, and he, and he, man, he was a smart guy. He could have gone to Corinth and persuaded them and done the way that the uh, Jewish people, uh, the, the Pharisees did back in that day. But no, he went to them determining not to convince them. Look at verse 2 here. For I determined... Not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. What does determine mean? Here's the definition of determine from Cambridge Dictionary. Determine is wanting to do something very much and not allowing anyone or any difficulties to stop you. You see, we need the disposition, the mind frame, the determination to tell simply to others Jesus. We evangelize. This is what we do. We tell Jesus And Jesus crucified. Just tell him from a place of knowing the Lord. Very simply, Jesus and Jesus crucified. We tell when we're evangelizing, we're sharing the gospel with someone. Don't think that you have to have it all together. You've got to have all these words and these eloquent speech and everything. Just keep it simple. Tell Jesus and Jesus crucified. Who was he and what did he do? What did he do for us? Who was he? He was the son of God. He was the perfect son of God, and he was in heaven, and he enjoyed 
Heaven, because you can imagine, heaven is absolutely amazing and beautiful. We can't even conceive the beauty and the wonder and, and how incredible heaven is going to be. And Jesus was in heaven, and he chose to come to earth when he didn't have to. He was born of a virgin. He was tempted just like you and I. And he lived a life sinless, blameless. He was this perfect, spotless lamb of God. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, but whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. That's who Jesus is. And what did he do? What did he do? He went to the gruesome death on the cross. That while me and you were still sinners, Christ died for us so that we can have life and life in him. So that he restored relationship between the people of God and and God himself, the Father. That's what Jesus did. That's what he did for us. He died a gruesome death so that we can have life with him. So what do you do when you share the gospel with someone? You don't try to convince them and worry about trying to debate with them in eloquent words. You keep it simple. Just like Paul kept it simple. You keep it simple. Christ and Christ crucified. Amen? So we must be determined to keep it simple. Keep the main thing the main thing. Who is Jesus and what he did? Which leads me to number two. What can we learn from Paul in this passage? There's a shortage of believers determined to not back down despite difficulties. How many of us ever share the gospel with someone because we get ridiculed or something else happens that we just stop and we don't share the gospel anymore with anyone else? You know, it didn't always go well for Paul either. Because he says this in 1 Corinthians 2. I was with you in weakness and fear and in much trembling. I was, weak, I was with you in weakness and fear and much trembling. Now this fear here, it's not talking about the fear of the Lord. We talked about the fear of the Lord a couple weeks back. We said the fear of the Lord is not to be scared of God. But the fear of the Lord is to be terrified of being outside of his presence. So the fear of the Lord here, though, is because Paul is a human being and he was rejected He was put in jail. He was beaten. And so Paul is literally scared to do it. But guess what he doesn't do? He doesn't listen to his emotions. He doesn't back down because at one time it didn't go well. He keeps sharing. He keeps pushing forward. Imagine if Paul had stopped the first time he was rejected, the first time he had difficulty. Imagine what would happen. You know Jesus himself? He was also rejected in his own town. He was telling them things that they didn't want to hear. And they, ch- they chased Jesus, his own town, to an edge of a cliff, and they wanted to push Jesus off the cliff. That's what they wanted to do, to the Son of God. But I just imagine Jesus did his, his Jesus thing, and it, all the Bible says is that the crowds parted. He's probably like, man, I got guns, y'all. Y'all better back up right now like I'm coming through. Right? Imagine what would happen if we backed down. Just think about and I'm not trying to beat you up, it's just, just for me too. Imagine the people that ever heard the gospel because of the feeling of being fearful, the feeling of being scared. We have to not back down, but we have to go after what the Lord is leading us into. It is a privilege to be obedient to the Lord. It's a privilege. You see, we need the fervor and the passion like Paul. Look at Acts, Acts 18.6. But when they opposed him and blasphemed, So he's experiencing opposition. He shook his garments and said to them, your blood be on your own heads. I am clean. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. You see, Paul shook off and he moved on. He didn't let it bother him. He was rejected by the Jews in Corinth, and so he went to the Gentiles instead. He continued to the next person. He didn't back down despite rejection, despite resistance, despite difficulty. We must persevere. Sometimes God uses the times that we were rejected to humble us, to allow us to realize that it's not us that's going to bring the increase, but it's only the Lord. Listen, sometimes when we go and we share the gospel, we're just watering the seed. We may not see the harvest right in that moment. We're watering the seed, and later on somebody else will reap the harvest. You see, we're in this together. Which leads me to point three this morning. Point three. There's a shortage of believers determined to walk humbly in the power of the Holy Spirit. Look at verse 4 through 5. In my speech, in my preaching, were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration 
of the spirit and of power. That your faith should, be, should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Because if someone's faith is in the wisdom of men, like, it's not going to work. And the beautiful thing about that is we're not trying to convince them to do anything. So the pressure's off, y'all. Don't you understand that? The pressure is off. Like, all we're doing is sharing from a place of just knowing him. And the pressure's off. We've got to let the Holy Spirit do the work. You know, I really, I, I enjoy golf. I'm not very good. Uh, I was good at one point when I played a lot. And now I'm just kind of uh, mediocre. But there's a saying in golf uh, that you let the club do the work. Like when you're swinging, you let the club do the work. Now when I haven't played for a while, I like to do this thing called grip and rip. Like I'm just, I'm standing up there at gymnos. I'm up there, and man, I'm going to swing as hard as I possibly can. I'm going to try to knock the ball as far as I can. But what ends up happening is I end up slicing it off to the right or hooking it to the left or whatever else, and it's not straight and everything. But when you are playing smart, I go through three things in my head when I'm playing smart. Uh, I say this. I say to myself, uh, head down. In other words, keep your head down, keep your eye on the ball. Everybody knows that. If you play any kind of sport, keep your eye on the ball. Uh, bend your legs because I'm too upright if I, if I don't bend my legs. And then swing easy. Why do you swing easy? Because you're letting the club do the work. You're letting the club do the work. Head down, bend your legs, swing easy. Just swing easy. Let the club do the work. In golf, you let the club do the work. When you're a laborer, and you're a worker from the kingdom of God, you simply just rely on the Holy Spirit. Let the Holy Spirit do the work, y'all. You let him do the work. And that's why in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus says this. He says, but you will receive power. Say power. power. That word power in the Greek is this word dunamis. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. You see, we must have dunamis power. What is dunamis power? This is the definition. Dunamis means the ability to perform an action. It's where we get the word dynamite. What is the purpose of dunamis? It's the ability to perform a task. What is our task as laborers in the kingdom of God? Our task is this. Our task is to be a witness to our sphere of influence, to our city, to our nation, and to the ends of the earth. Amen? That's the task ahead of us. Church, listen this morning. There is an emergency. We have to have an urgency for such a time as this because there are people literally dying and going to hell that don't know the Lord. And we have to understand and realize if we really believe what we believe, if we really believe that one day people are either going to heaven or they're going to hell, we must live with a sense of urgency in this place and share the gospel. Listen, this message is not about building a church and getting more numbers. You might be saying, oh, he's a new pastor and he just wants to get more numbers. Listen, the the purpose, I don't care what church they go to. I just want to see them saved. I want to see them go somewhere. I want to see them know the gospel and have a relationship with Jesus. That has to be our motive. Who cares if they come here? Whatever church they go to, it doesn't matter. Share the gospel. Share the gospel. You know, I was walking through the hallway about two months ago and we had a sign out there. And it says, and it said this at one point, it said, invite someone to church. And the Holy Spirit dropped in my heart. He said, why are you just trying to invite people to church? Change it. He said, change it to share, uh, I forget what it says right now, but it goes along this line. Uh, <laughs> share Jesus with someone. That's what it says on the sign. It doesn't say invite someone to church. I don't care if you invite someone to church. What I care about, inviting them to church is just a tool. Let's just be honest. It's a tool. It's an easy way of getting them here and, and, and discipling them. They need some place to go. But the goal is to see them come to relationship with Jesus. And so we change the sign of, hey, tell someone about Jesus. That's what it says. Tell someone about Jesus. And so you grab a card and you tell someone about Jesus. May we be people who tell Uh, the world about the one that we love, the one that we care for. May we not be secret agents. Some of us, we keep the Lord to ourselves too much and we're acting like we're secret agents undercover. 
Come out from cover and begin to share the gospel with people. Be a laborer of the harvest. Be a worker for the kingdom of God. And right now, I believe in this room, the Holy Spirit's going to begin to drop names and faces in your mind right now that you need to share the gospel with. Right now, he's dropping names. I've been praying all week for the Holy Spirit to drop names and faces in your mind and in your heart that you need to share the gospel with. What we're going to do this morning is that you can find on your seat some note cards. All right? There's some note cards on your seat. And uh, if you don't have one, there's, uh, there's some up here here in a moment we're going to move. But... What I want you to do, I'm going to pray here in a moment and ask the Holy Spirit to speak to you. I want you to write write down on that note card two to three names that you're going to actively pray for and you're going to share the gospel with. Because we are the people of God. We are laborers. We are workers. What did Jesus say? The harvest is plentiful. There's plenty of people that don't know Jesus in our day and age. But what? The workers are few. You're called to be a worker. Let's get to work, church. I'm going to pray. I want you to write down those names after I pray. You can even write them down while I pray. It doesn't matter. And then when you get done, there's going to be people up here who are going to help you pin those names to the cross. And what we're going to be praying for is the blood of Jesus covers them. Let's pray right now. Holy Spirit, I pray right now that you would drop names and faces on people's hearts and minds that they need to actively pray for and share the gospel with Jesus. Lord, we've all fallen short of the glory of God, and we all need saving grace. So may we be a church that walks out and shares the gospel with people. In Jesus' name, amen. Write those names down. I want to invite you.